I don't think I would change a single experience I've had, despite all the things that, that have been very difficult. I did something really unique here. Maybe that, maybe enlightenment, but that never would have happened without all this stuff happening. Life is only this finite thing, and it's really not that long. Ride it out, through thick and thin, bad weather and good. So uh, 17 odd years ago, I, I was at this exact same building, uh, the Grand Simcoe Foresters Armory here in Barrie, um, and I was applying for the military. I had just finished my, uh, my application process, and I'd finished my, uh, my medical testing, and I'd also finished my aptitude testing, and I'd come here, uh, you know, just, just a little 19-year-old kid, you know, with a, with a little lowered car, and thought he, was, thought he was the world, you know, thought he was a tough guy. I came from a military family and as a kid it was just normal to me to have people with stories, you know, and, and people with service. I, I felt like I was amongst, amongst giants of men. And I did spend a lot of time with my, my grandparents. I had a lot of influence from my grandfather, Robert Slavin. He was in the Navy. He served in the Second World War, both the Battle of the Atlantic and the Pacific. I grew up in his light, in his guidance. He was so excited about being a grandpa and for it to be a boy was like even better. Greg was always with Papa. My dad was the one that always encouraged him to do everything. He was a big part of Greg's life. It was it meant more for me to make him proud than it than it did for you know anything else I was doing. It, he, 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 was, he was just such a noble man, a good man, just a giant among men as far as, and I knew that from a young age, you know. My uncle was also in the military for 28 years. He was a big influence on me because he was kind of like my fun-loving uncle. You know, I was really interested in, in that kind of life, in, in sort of doing those things that they got to do. My uncle was traveled the world, my grandfather had traveled the world, very well versed in, in just, just life. And I think that's where it started. I got an opportunity to join the cadets uh, with the Grand Simcoe Foresters cadet unit here at the armories. And I remember standing here, and I think I was even front row over here. Some of the kids that I was with in particular was just, he wouldn't line up, he was all over the place. And that's not necessarily somebody who's not going to be good in that atmosphere. Maybe that he would require that, but, but I don't remember him coming back. <laughs> so it was, uh, it wasn't, wasn't, it's not for everyone. People look at you differently when you're, when you're, when you're in the forces. People, it's, and, and in cadets in this case, there's something you garner from that. You know, having the boots polished, having your stuff, you know, perfectly, perfectly ironed and, and perfectly fit and, and, you know, no lint and just these little things that seem like an insignificant, insignificant in today's life are so important and, they're, and, they, and they ingrain these things in you and maybe you don't even understand why at first, especially as a teenager in cadets, you, you don't understand why, but those things, they, they just, they all culminate and when you get to finally portray them in a parade setting like I got to do in front of my grandfather and, and, and be at the head of the parade, it was, I don't know, there's, there's few, if any, things that made me more proud than that. I joined the military and was sworn in on uh, 4th of July 2001. I got there and I, I, th I thought I knew a lot, but I knew shit. It's the most shocking, you know, you're, you're going from a completely different lifestyle into a rigid and unforgiving and there's no excuses and uh, some things are very technical, some things are very physical. It's, it's a very different atmosphere than the average 19 year old has to, you know, is, is dealing with. And then I felt like I had kind of this vision of, of life and, and what could be done, what, what the human body could be put through. and stressors and things like that I, I had this kind of newfound perspective or newfound strength and it was a good feeling. I had no problem with Greg joining the military I was very proud I was really proud of the fact that he chose a military career doing paramedic I didn't expect that he would go to war I was really hoping that that wasn't going to be an issue that I or a bridge that I'd have to cross. My perception at the time was not that the military was, you know, we, we, weren't, we, weren't, we weren't in combat, we weren't out there, you know, fighting wars and, and whatnot was my perception at that time. I thought we were peacekeeping. And then, boom, 
I was actually on my basic training when 9-11 occurred. I was on a leg of my map and compass uh, training. We come across a road, there's a older master warrant officer, I didn't know this at the time, he's turned around, and he's listening to his radio really, really loud in his truck. So we hear over here on the radio and somebody caught an ear that New York City had been attacked and there had been something like 60,000 people killed. That, that's, that's what somebody had heard. Somebody passes us down the line to the group of us and we go, holy, we have families out there. We think, you know, it could be World War III, but we couldn't be further from civilization being out here in our little group. So we go over and we kind of congregate around the vehicle and uh, that lasts about a minute and a half. And then the, the master warrant turns around and he goes, what the bloody hell, what are you doing here? And I goes, he's French and what the tabernacle, get out of here, you're, you're in my way. Or, 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 what are you supposed to be doing? Who's your warrant officer? And he starts screaming at us and we're, we're still, and now we're still hearing, you know, plane hit the Pentagon and we're, you know, the whole world, War of the Worlds is going on on the, on the radio. And here we are doing our math. And now we're being told to just forget about it and go, and go in the woods and do the rest of our, so we did. We, we went out, there was another, about 35, 40 minutes of trudging through the woods and finally one of our, our sergeants came and found us. No one's saying anything, nothing at this point, like silence. And uh, sergeant comes out, he's on the radio in his truck, comes out and he goes, man, he goes, you guys are a good time you joined the military because you're all going to war. I remember the first time that I knew that it was something that what war was and maybe the cost of it was that my friend, uh, Andrew Eichlinboom, he was killed during Op Medusa. I, I heard on the radio, I heard his name and I, I, I just, at first I thought, well, I know that guy. And I went over to the TV and I just kind of stopped and body kind of went cold. I mean, other people had been killed prior to, prior to Andrew, but that was the first time I really knew somebody. I mean, somebody I'd, I'd hung out with, somebody I'd talked to, somebody I'd, I'd gone through some shit with. It was like the reality of war came pretty bloody quickly. And I just remember feeling like I couldn't, I couldn't, talk or move or I don't remember like breaking down into tears I just remember being really off like my world was just whew. there's the constant feeling at the back of your head that you're I mean you're you're in the uniform you are subject to the same unlimited liability that they are but uh, I applied to go overseas it was gonna be a lot of work there was a lot of time away from family you're really flying into the unknown there and then you're in Afghanistan Everything is dangerous over there. I mean, every person you look at on the street is a potential person that wants to harm you. Some people are just there to watch you. Some people are there to annoy you. A couple of rounds here and there, see what you do. Try to get you into another area where they can plant a, you know, an IED and, and, and hopefully get you on the way out. Aside from that, you know, you also have the kind of the kind of things like you know flying in a combat helicopter. Well, the, the helicopter can just as easily come falling out of the sky because of a mechanical issue as it could if you take small arms fire. I remember sitting, I had the closest seat to the back door and I remember just looking out, you know, if that helicopter was just to go down at any second for any reason, you know, you're in, you're in an area where you don't know right from left, north from south, east from west, and the likelihood of people in that area not being pleasant to you was probably pretty high. But I was alone a lot. Barter for rides and whatnot uh, with, with guys that were going from A to B. What our role is, was is to prevent illness before it happened. My job primarily was to go out as, as the junior P-Med tech at the time, was to go out as a sort of the eyes and ears of the, of the task force surgeon and go forward and look at all the different areas where we're operating and determine and, and write reports on my return. Sometimes I'm and mini laptop in the middle of Hanshire Valley or something and give him a real representation of what was going on in the battle space from a health and safety standpoint because there's nothing that cripples a fighting force more than, than, than disease or sickness. The earliest moment that, I, that really affected it for me was when Gregor first went over, there was someone killed not, not too long after. They shut down all the communication at the base when someone is killed. So he can't contact us. So we don't know who's dead. And that was the most, that was probably the biggest eye-opening time for me, was I didn't know if he was okay. What were those two, three days like? Hell. I couldn't think. I couldn't sleep. 
I would be tossing and turning in, at night. We took fire out quite a few times on different occasions, mostly in vehicles, pot shots, bang bang, stuff going off the side of the vehicle. Up here right now in the Panchir Valley, place is sketchy as shit. It's like less than, an, I don't know, maybe 200 feet of berms protecting this whole camp. Heavy insurgent activity in the area. We got OPs on all the corners here, labs. Nails right over there. That's probably shooting at our guys. Sometimes, you know, you're expected to be able to do that. You're expected to be able to turn that thing on that lets you cope with that kind of stress to a level where, it, where it's life and death. You become what you are trained to do. So a medic becomes a person who can save your life. Having those people be a worth and pull together, it's such a bond, it's such a, such a different thing. And, and, and I think you hunger for that. I think you hunger for that substance in your life ever after. I'll tell you the honest to God truth. When I got back from Afghanistan, it took a while, but I, I missed it. There's a realness to the war. There's a realness to that experience. There's just this organicness, this authenticness to, to those kind of relationships that you don't have here. Eventually you kind of forget how that feeling and it kind of goes away, you know, and then everything kind of feels a little more fake. One of my jobs, one of my, my responsibilities overseas, and I took this very seriously, was um, decontaminating gear primarily that people were wearing when they were killed in action and along with that vehicles that they were in. It was hard, but you don't want to say anything. It's, it's a responsibility. Somebody has to do this. And this stuff is like, this is a person who's given their all. You know, they paid the ultimate sacrifice. And in dealing with these pieces of clothing or whatever, it, there's a certain dignity that has to be afforded to these people. At least I put that pressure on myself. So I took this upon myself to do, I ended up doing quite a bit of it. So I started going through this stuff, taking stuff out of the pockets. And in this particular case, this person had pictures of their uh, their wife and kids in their wallet. I remember laying those out on the table as I'm scrubbing the blood off this, uh, the blood and the cordite and the soot and the dirt off this uniform. And I remember just looking in those like kids' eyes and uh, you know, this, this person had given their life and they were a soldier. Part of what soldiers do, right? They, they go over and some of them, some of them die. But uh, to look in these kids', uh, these kids eyes and, and just know that there's so much more of a human impact to this thing that we're doing. I knew what was coming for this family and for the, ultimately for this, everyone this person had touched in their life. But all you really do is swallow that down. And those kind of things, they stay there for so long. And uh, I did tons more of those, I mean, sitting in vehicles in 100 degree weather with a Tyvek suit, scrubbing the, scrubbing the, uh, the remains, well, what was left, if that hadn't already been somewhat taken out, you know, just, you know this person is the last place this person sat. Probably joking, bumming a smoke off Buddy, and all of a sudden, always hear about about somebody being killed in action and on our tour there were there were quite a few it was a it was a fairly pretty bloody tour as far as uh, as far as people being killed in action and and especially being injured as well uh, gruesomely but there's a whole other element to this war fighting thing to this sacrifice thing it's so much more than just a picture in the paper it's so much more than what we give what we think of as as somebody being killed in action, there's, there's so much more that goes on, it like reverberates out. You know, the human aspect of war is, is what hurts the most. Being in the military as a young man or a woman takes a lot of toll on your family. And uh, when I was overseas, I suffered a, a divorce. I, I, was, I knew I was coming back to a divorce. If anything keeps you going during a tour, it's your buddies. And it's also what you have to come back to. You know, knowing that uh, that wasn't gonna be what I was gonna come back to. And when I sort of lost that, or, you know, I, my mind went to the spot where I had lost everything, 
I was really sinking. I, th I remember thinking that a couple of times overseas. I remember thinking, thinking, what if I just turn it off, let it go? He wasn't the normal Greg anymore. And I realized that pretty quickly. And I didn't know what to do to help him. I had no clue. And I thought, well, OK, maybe he'll get over this like my dad did. And uh, I got home, and the only thing that was, uh, was there in the fridge, there was a bottle of rum and, and a bottle of Pepsi, I believe. I remember sitting. I didn't even take off my combat pants. I was sitting on the living room floor of my, uh, my place and just crying, just knowing that my life was, was irreparably changed. And I'm, I don't expect any pity. I don't want any pity. It wasn't, you know, I made my bed in a lot of ways in the way I reacted to the situation. And, and I was in a hell's fucking half acre of my own, you know, being getting divorced. And um, I wasn't reacting well to anything, you know. Um, I, was, I was a mess. It was about a, a month or two after I got back, I was on my way back from a party. I'm in my truck. It's about 10.30, maybe 11 at night. I catch a glint of something out of my left eye. I can't really describe it. It was like a, maybe like a, like a torso. No arms, no legs, no head. Like a chunk of meat, sort of moving. Like a, like a, like a worm would move, peristalsis kind of, across the road. And I, uh, about 100 meters or so in front of the truck and I slam on the brakes. And as I'm stopping, I feel like this tingling sensation in my jaw. Pretty much like every hair on my back stands up. I get real cold, stomach starts turning to knots. Get out of the car, truck, and I just start dry heaving. It seemed like, for, like forever, it was probably like five minutes or something, I don't know. And I, I catch my breath kind of thing. I'm just leaning on the back of my truck with this, my head down. There's people coming by me on the highway there, it's the middle of nowhere, right by this research forest there. And I finally kind of regain my composure, still feel like shit. Face is all like pale white, sweating. And I walk over to where, on the road where I, I had seen this, this thing and uh, nothing there. I remember one time I got a phone call in the middle of the night. Greg's losing it. He says he's going to commit suicide. I need somebody to go to Petawawa. And it was a snowstorm. And we got there, and I remember walking in the house and taking Greg by the arms and looking at him and looking in his face. And I mean, I've looked in my son's face many times, and there was always someone there. And this time, it was a black cloud. It was like looking through two black holes. And I was terrified that he was going to take his own life that night. Worst thing I can ever remember is looking in his eyes and seeing nothing. I think that everybody has a little bit of fight in them. There comes a time when, you know, you say enough is enough, you know, you're not, you're not doing well and you know, you know when, you're, when your kids are born that you know, you'd do anything for them and that you want to be there a long time for them. I can remember when my, my son was born, holding him and at that moment, you, know, you, just, you just know that, that you would give your life for this person. I really had something to fight for. At his darkest, that was the only thing that kept him afloat, you know. That would have been the only thing that he thought, this is the worst scenario possible, I'm losing my career, or this or that. It's the kids that kept him they're the only thing that kept his head above water. It's a choice we make, you know, you, you really have to do the work. I really did take a lot of time to reflect on things that I'd never reflected on before. I wasn't addressing the fact that I wasn't sleeping properly. I wasn't addressing the fact that I wasn't eating properly. Uh, I wasn't addressing the fact that I didn't have the best, you know, outlets. I didn't go to the, you know, the gym and things like this. And those minor adjustments, if you can make them, are going to make a world of difference. But once you've built that one step and two steps and three steps, and pretty soon your, your head sort of emerges over the, over the level ground. And I've been very fortunate to have, you know, the support of my family, to have my fiance there with me. And she's been super helpful in, in getting me back on track. At first, I was very skeptical of anybody being in Greg's life. I saw one marriage die in Afghanistan. 
I saw another relationship collapse uh, in 2013. Um, I saw Greg going through all these hard times and I was terrified to have someone else come in and do something else. So I was very, not very receptive of a new person. Now that I think back on it, I think that I was angry that this was happening to my child. And that was the worst probably six months of my life. <laughs> um, because I didn't know how to communicate with him. I was so angry and I couldn't get my own anger out and he was angry and we butted heads. And Rachel was the one who extended the olive leaf. She was the one who brought this family back together. She definitely was the main reason I think that Greg is where he is today. I really believe that if he didn't have Rachel, we wouldn't have Greg. Nope. Yeah, I think nope. so. At the beginning, I didn't even really know he had PTSD. I thought that um, because you don't see it all right away, right? It's um, he's uh, jovial, he's happy, he's charismatic. You don't see the they they have a very good front of not having anything going on mentally, you know. But yeah, I felt like I was a little in over my head at the beginning, to be honest. It's a lot of, I wouldn't call it baggage, but it was a lot of stuff going on with your life, you know. But I welcomed it openly, you know. I, I, I like a challenge and yeah, he was worth it. It was Greg. It wasn't the circumstance. It wasn't the baggage. It wasn't the, the timing. It wasn't me. It was, he was worth it. I was that person that I was logical too and rational. And I think that that helped a lot too. Whenever he's starting to spin, he thinks like a hundred steps ahead. I think, okay, the next step is just the simple task. Let's do that, and then we do the next one. And we don't have to worry about what happens in three weeks because you do this now. So I think that that helped a lot. Because of what he's been through, nothing, he feels like nothing can touch him now. He's been through the worst um, that a person can imagine. I really do feel life again. I really do live life, you know, and, and, it, and it might suck some days, you know, it, it, it might suck to feel that and, and feel pain. and. But I want it all, you know, I, I, was, I was so numb for so long. I, I want all the feeling in the world, you know, and I want it to be real and organic. And I think that's really the growth, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm growing every day. And uh, I'll forever be thankful for the, you know, for the, for the, worst, the worst times. And that sounds crazy, but I think when your worst nightmares, when you're thankful for your worst nightmares, then your greatest dreams are pretty, are pretty, uh, are pretty amazing. People who have never had anyone in the military, I don't know if they could ever understand exactly what the cost is. Yeah, the cost of their service. Uh, people, people don't understand the cost, what it cost him to protect them. Yeah, I've had my battles uh, with mental illness and PTSD. But I'll tell you this, there are better days. There will come a time when those things you've had to endure and those hard times that you may be experiencing now are going to help you and they're going to form you into a better, more understanding version of yourself. You don't get a diamond without applying great pressure. Because I'll tell you, no amount of rock marching or walking through, you know, doing, doing any kind of physical feat in the military was as hard as pulling my ass up out of that basement room and out of that bottle and going and getting help and, and failing 6,000 times at that and then picking myself up and moving on to, to be where I'm headed now. Nothing was that hard. And, and if there was a red or a blue pill, make it all go away, make it all... I know for a fact that I wouldn't do it. The daily pain of the scars that remain from the long fight sometimes seem overwhelming and I grow tired. But what can I do? Do I lay down and die? Not a chance. For to do so would be to degrade all the effort and perseverance it took to get here to my current place. And to throw aside all of the hard-gained wisdom I have earned. 
I push on, knowing that wherever this life leads, I will triumph. And at the end, I will have truly lived, tested, and pushed my limits. Isn't that truly life? We hurt, we heal, and we grow. To ignore and hope that these tests cease to exist is to degrade the human experience altogether. Besides, what is a triumph if attained easily? I intend to finish what I've started and to get where I meant to go. These scars don't define me.